thanks. Of course, I can't read the future. Neither can you. And um, I think mathematics on the whole is kind of unpredictable. That's what makes it exciting, isn't it? That um, um, new things happen. So, so this is a hard topic to talk about. I'm not going to, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to talk about technical mathematics at all. I just want to try to step back a little bit and, um, and reflect on where we are and um, where, we, where we've been and where we might go in three-dimensional geometry and topology. This is a, of course, I mean, the, the last few years have been a, you know, a watershed, we're at a watershed, presumably. Um, the, um, I mean, one of the main guiding principles of um, topology, uh, well, of low dimensional topology, three dimensional topology in particular, was the, um, you know, the, the Poincare conjecture. And, you know, I don't know, I, I don't know whether we should think of it as a guiding light that, um, that led us to higher and higher places or a sort of a, a, a sort of a, um, a, a swamp that got us all mired in, <laughs> in the muck. I think, I think there's definitely a lot of that. Um, so so the, um, I think there's definitely a lot of that. But, but, um, but anyway, we've, you know, the first hundred years or so, or a little more than a hundred years of three-dimensional topology, this was a big um, shining beacon, and um, now it's, um, so now we've passed that. So what happens now? Um, okay, so um, the, um, it's hard to, hard to say what I want to say. Um, anyway, the, the, the process of, um, the process of mathematics is, is um, I mean, it tends to be kind of wandering and, 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 and jumpy. So how does this, um, how does this happen? Well, people, people to, to a large extent, I think mathematical knowledge is, is a living entity. People, um, people got interested in mathematics by talking to each other. Um, of course, it's necessary to read a lot. There's a lot of written mathematics, but, um, but I think the important things in mathematics often happen I mean, they're somehow alive. They live in people's brains. They live in communities of people talking to each other. And a, a lot of what's written down in mathematics is um, just not, well, it, it's very hard to sort of rehydrate uh, an area of mathematics from, simply from what's written down. M mathematical papers often, um, mathematical papers often well, they, they're highly context dependent. They, they, um, they, they depend on a set of working knowledge and assumptions, and it's well known that, and et cetera, et cetera, that, um, that, of course, they can be reconstructed in most cases, but it's very painful to reconstruct if, you're not, if you don't have access to the members of this community. So, so uh, as a result, I mean, it's, it's my experience anyway that, um, that 
you know, that, that mathematicians often go into one, one area and study it, and, um, you know, they get very immersed in that stuff, and be, because other people are studying a certain part of mathematics, then, um, then it makes it interesting and, interesting and exciting. And eventually, either, either um, you know, the, <coughs> this, this thread of mathematics can, um, can run out, or, you know, people can give up on something, or, or they can discover what they were looking for, and then they don't know what to, they don't know what to do next, and then people start shifting to other interests and other interests. And it, it can happen that the whole sort of interesting tradition of mathematics sort of evaporates in that way. And that's one reason I'm interested in this conjecture of what is the future of three-dimensional topology. I mean, a lot of interesting things have been going on, are currently going on, and um, I think it's important to try to think of how to, um, how to package, package ideas, how to, um, how to aim them, I mean, how to package them and how to aim efforts so that, so that they don't just evaporate. Let, let, me, um, let me talk about two exam a couple of examples in, well, in my mathematical experience. So there, there, yeah, there are two or three examples of this where I get, where I've been um, affected by, by this evaporation sort of phenomenon. So one is um, in the, um, well, the theory of, um, well, the, the dynamics and just the classification of, of um, automorphisms of surfaces or homeomorphisms homeomorphisms of surfaces. So, uh, you know, at one point, actually in connection with trying to understand three manifolds, I became interested in, um, this is the early 70s, I became interested in trying to understand how, what, what a homeomorphism of a surface really looks like, what, what it really looks like. And I, I developed a sort of mental picture of it, um, of, of, I mean, at first I just wanted to show that things of this sort exist. I developed a sort of mental picture of homeomorphisms of surfaces where um, there would be, there would be um, a, a sort of a, a, a singular foliation, something like this, of lines where the, where the, that would be stretched by the homeomorphism. And another, and another, um, and, an, and another sort of orthogonal foliation of lines where it would be compressed. And so, so my picture was that there'd be a coordinate system like this, where um, one would be stretched, the other would be compressed, and then it would exactly match up with the same coordinate system on the, um, on the return. I became interested in this because of, um, actually because of trying to understand hyperbolic three manifolds, trying to prove that there were many that sort of most three manifolds couldn't be hyperbolic, which I ultimately failed at. Um, but um, so, so this, is, this came from a picture of trying to understand what the th second fundamental form of a surface inside a three manifold would need to look like if, it, um, if the three manifold fibered, fibered over a circle. And eventually, eventually it turned out this is a good picture Eventually, I worked quite hard and you know, found, found ways to prove that um, most homeomorphisms can be put into this form, and all homeomorphisms of surfaces can be decomposed into, well, into simple pieces that are either this form or else they map sort of with finite order in a kind of isometric thing. Anyway, there, there's, a, you know, there's a classification of surface homeomorphisms. But, um, but just as I was um, sort of getting it finally pieced together, I, somebody, somebody asked me if I'd ever heard of the work of Nielsen. 
And um, I hadn't, so I went to the library and started looking at it. Uh, and um, I mean, it turned out that he'd done, well, he'd done a huge amount of work on many of these same lines. Um, eventually, um, well, I mean, he, he didn't have a complete geometric picture, but he had something that, well, in my mind was equivalent to it. And, um, and this, was, this was work he'd done in the 20s and 30s, or um, maybe four, I forget the exact dates anyway, and it was sort of pre-World War II mostly, I believe. And, um, and at, at one time, lots of people knew about it, but by the time I was working on, um, on this theory, eventually they're called pseudo-anosive homeomorphisms, um, you know, I talked to many, many mathematicians, I gave lots of talks and so on, and nobody, almost, well, for a long time, nobody mentioned this to me. It just is a sign how, you know, important bodies of knowledge can, can just get lost. That's one, that's one example of, um, the sort of sets me back a little. Another example in my personal experience is, well, this is a vague example, but just um, in a long, for a long time, up through about the um, 50s or so, I think there was a tradition of studying um, three-dimensional topology and geometry, which is much closer to what I later um, developed. So, if, you know, the mathematicians at that time thought, thought quite a lot about constructing three manifolds out of, um, out of geometric pieces. I mean, it was, it was um, you know, there may have been only a few examples, but, um, yeah. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't highly developed, but it was a, it was a tradition that was um, very alive. By the time I studied topology, um, no, nobody, nobody um, connected the two, connected geometry and topology. In fact, topology sort of moved on to, um, you know, a lot of, it became very fashionable for mathematicians to think about higher dimensional mathematics, higher dimensional, you know, topology, and, and, and they, a lot of people regarded three-dimensional topology or low-dimensional topology as a kind of backwater and sort of sociologically it, it was a little bit of a backwater for, um, for, for many years. And the, so, and then another, the other example I wanted to mention is um, my early work was on the, uh, my earliest work was on the theory of foliations. There was a whole huge cluster of interest in the theory of foliations. Um, uh, when I was a graduate student and for a little while afterwards, a lot of interesting things were developed about classifying spaces for foliations and constructions of foliations and characteristic classes for foliations and so forth. And, and the connection to the, you know, the, the structure of the group of homeomorphisms and the group of diffeomorphisms of a manifold and the homology of the group of diffeomorphisms of a manifold as a discrete group. A lot of things that I, at one time, was very involved in. There was a whole community of people involved in. And, it, and by now, I almost never encounter somebody who knows much about it or would be able to use it. And, and it, this partly includes myself. I've partly forgotten all this, some of this stuff, and maybe because, because it became too interesting and complicated or too advanced. So what, so this raises the question, you know, what, what, what are the forces that determine what pieces of, what pieces of mathematics can be built on and continue in the future um, in, a, in a steady way, and what are the things that are forgotten for a time and are only rediscovered or re, resuscitated by some scholar, perhaps, but, um, you know, what, what are the things that are useful and perpetuate in the future, and what are the things that sort of tend to diminish? And, and three-dimensional topology is, in a, is poised in a little bit of a state where, um, where 
you know, th there could be a, a, a cross, where, there could be a forks where people start pursuing things that become more and more technical and lose sight of, you know, think of the big pictures, the big questions of, as satisfied, or, or it could go on and um, branch much more, I believe. So that's, that's my concern. Okay. Um, this is a this picture you've been staring at is a picture of a hyperbolic three manifold. So, um, so now I mean because of the work of Perlman together with a lot of other people. Um, we know that um, three manifolds, two dimensional manifolds can all be described in a kind of geometric form. This is, a, this is an example of a hyperbolic three manifold. Um, this is one of the smallest volume hyperbolic manifolds. This, this particular computer program is by. Um, this is, by, this is a program called Curved Spaces by Jeff Weeks. Let me just, um, let me just show you. I hope this is going to work. Yeah, let's just try. Um, a, another example of a space. I'll show you a simpler one, how this works. This is, this is a picture, the same program showing a picture of the three torus. We're going to fly through it. In, in the three torus, this is a kind of flat geometry. It's a little confusing interface with this program, but there we go. We can fly around in different directions. Everything's just repeated regularly at, a, um, at regular intervals. In a, in a three-dimensional array. Um, um, here's, another, here's another example of a flat three-manifold, a three-manifold with Euclidean geometry that we can fly through. It's populated with a single galaxy. And, and here, um, this manifold is, is made, you can kind of see these particular manifolds, I think, a little bit. It's made by, um, it's not, not, everything is not exactly repeated. You know, maybe, maybe I'll put an earth in here instead. I'm limited by the resources of this program. Now, th this, um, okay, so I th let's slow it down a little. You can see there, the, the different Earths are turning in slightly different directions. So this is a manifold where it's based on a third, gluing the mapping torus of, t you take a hexagonal torus and you glue it by a one third of a turn. So it's hard to, it's hard to, um, it's hard to apprehend it from this picture, even, even this simple uh, manifold, although you get some sense of what it is. And I mean, in, in principle, I think of computer programs like this as, as one way to package mathematics so that it can be um, it can be transmitted, it can be um, understood by others. But um, there's a there's a phenomenon known as um, bit rot. So at one time I used to do, I, 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 I used a program called, um, called Geomview in a unit in it called Manaview that had been written by um, Charlie Gunn to, to do programs, to, to do demos of this sort. And um, Geomview still exists somewhere on the net that can work for some architectures of computers, but I haven't been able to get it recently on my 
recent Macintoshes. And, um, and so this program, Curved Spaces, by, by Jeff Weeks, is a, does many of the same things as Manaview. But, um, but, it, but the, having this kind of thing, you know, having a working program on current computers takes somebody doing always, you know, always rewriting software or doing new software. It takes somebody with a current interest. I'm going to, um, I'll show you one other kind of um, example. What should we do? The, Okay, this is a this is a, a manifold with spherical geometry. It's it's quite weird. Can can you tell what's happening? So um, <laughs> so in the sphere, there's a lensing in the three sphere. There's a lensing effect. This, this manifold is not the three-sphere, but it's a, it's a quotient of the three-sphere by a uh, finite group. Um, judging by the name of the file, which I didn't create, Jeff Weeks created, I would guess it's the binary icosahedral group. And, um, and anyway, there's a, there's a lensing effect. So some of the most distant well, okay, the, what, what you see, if you, if you lived in a, in a, in a um, world based on this geometry, what you would see is identical with, well, what, what you see here, but it's, it's um, I think, 120 copies of every single object. Of course, we have a certain you know, field of vision, so we don't see everything at once, but in principle, there's there's a, this group transforms the fundamental domain around to 120 copies of it. The, the three spheres tiled by 120 dodecahedra of, of, this, of this type joining three in a vertex. And anyway, the objects, so, in, in, so what you see is identical with the universal cover of the, wh what you would see by the identical copies in, in the universal cover. Really, really, the manifold is the quotient. It's just made of one of these dodecahedra with opposite faces glued together. Really, the, it's also known as the Poincaré dodecahedral space. What, what you see when you look inside a manifold is the universal cover. And the, um, the, the, most, the, the most distant objects are, are large, just like the close objects. It would be even more confusing if, if this program, if there wasn't fog in the, inserted by the program to make the bit, distant things look far away. I mean, when we're used to living in Euclidean space, the faraway things look like, well, they get brighter but smaller, but actually they're getting closer as they get smaller because the lens, they're, getting far, they're coming farther from the um, opposite focus of where we are, which is the antipodal point. Um, so this is, okay, anyway, this is, this, these kind of pictures are one way that I think, you know, it's a little piece of knowledge that can be encapsulated and, and understood by other people, but it also, it also illustrates this, the, um, these programs themselves illustrate the danger of um, this transmission process. There's a phenomenon of bit rot, but there's also a phenomenon of thought rot, where, um, where thoughts that used to work stop working because the context changes. That's, I mean, that's what happens with computer programs. The computer programs are equally valid. The context, you know, the, the machine they used to work on, the operating system they used to work on has been, quote, unquote, improved, and then the, um, then the programs stop working. The programs no longer work. And the same thing for thoughts. Now, not, not all computer programs decay to the same extent with time. Um, 
and I think there, there are principles that computer programmers have learned to, to, make, um, to make software that can be well, revised and extended in the future. And I think that the, the, really, the, I mean, one principle is just to document what's, what, your, what the program does. Um, but another principle is to attempt to have, well, I think, simple interface to the external world. What are the, what are the simple things that, um, what are the simple things, what are the simple pieces that you can extract from, from a, you know, well, from a computer program, but also from a thought process. So when, um, when, you're, th when you're in the middle of thinking about a piece of mathematics, there's all these different complex threads that don't actually mean much to anybody but the practitioners, a small group of practitioners. That small group of practitioners won't be around forever. And, but, but the most important, but mathematics is really all connected. And the important, one of the most important things in order to get these connections, I mean, in order for these connections, both to other mathematicians currently and to future mathematicians, I think, is to, to have simple, simple messages, simple thoughts that can come out of a piece of mathematics. Um, yeah, I'm going to I know I'm not giving a simple message right now, but um, but um, okay, this I, I, I wanted to again illustrate this. Well, both I mean, I, I think a, an important thing about three-dimensional topology, but also the bit rot and thought rot phenomenon. So this is another program that was written also by Jeff Weeks. Um, it went through many iterations over many years, but this is, um, that's not what I wanted to do. This is one of the, well, the best, the latest um, um, the latest um, version of um, you know of this particular program, this pr program was written on a Mac. I, I brought along my old, an old Mac laptop because it still runs um, classic Mac applications, which this program is. Anyway, this is a, a re this program Snappy is a really neat program. Um, um, you can so uh, yeah. All three manifolds, in some way, are connected by the process of um, Dane surgery and Dane filling. And a good place to start is with the three-sphere. So you start with the three-sphere. You can draw. You can take any knot or link in the three-sphere. You can remove the knot or link. That's what this complement button does. And SNAP-P attempts to find a hyperbolic structure. And most three manifolds have hyperbolic structures. So it's, it's very, very often successful. And you can get to other um, three manifolds by, by um, filling in um, filling in uh, fill, replacing the link, replacing the knot, but sew it in a different way. Or another way to say this is you could take a three manifold, remove a solid torus around any, um, any knot or link. And then you, um, you sew in solid toruses, but you sew them in by you know, a process called surgery or Dane, Dane filling. You sew them in by a different, um, by a different or an, ar uh, an arbitrary gluing map. And by that process, you could start with any oriented three manifold, any closed oriented three manifold, and you can get to any other closed oriented three manifold. So, so um, this program is quite good for that. You can see pictures. Um, let, let me just make sure I'll get a. 
I'll see if I can do this one. Oh yeah. So this is this is a picture. Oops. This is a picture of a fundamental domain for the hyperbolic structure for the manifold I just arbitrarily in, made up, where I removed the knot or link complement and um, and sewed it back in. And this this picture, in principle. I mean, now that I've done that computation, it, that could, in principle, um, be um, be put into the program here to to view the view the geometric structure on the three metal to fly around in it and um, to see to see what's what. Now, it, it I think it turns out that I mean there are some things you see, but it's hard to it's hard to actually detect or work with the topology of the three manifold by working with the pictures. Nonetheless, it gives you some kind of sense of what you're, of the object you're dealing with. Um, and so, so, so this particular, this particular polyhedron here um, has some face pairing. Oh, here you can even see it. The, the polyg each polygon is glued to another polygon of the same shape and color. And the shape is, the shape is, um, it has been computed so that it, it, it fits exactly within hyperbolic geometry. It will generate a discrete group of, I mean, it will, it will generate a tiling of hyperbolic space. This is a picture of the projective model for hyperbolic three space. There are many other pictures I could, we could look at, but, um, yeah. Anyway, so this kind of tool, the, the well, in principle, this kind of tool is one of the ways that um, mathematics could be understood and worked with by people outside the field, but I think in practice it's a little bit it's a little bit too um, too distant. Okay, let's. Um, let's go to that one. Um, Okay, what is the future, though? I haven't talked about uh, much of the future. So I think there are big questions remaining in three manifolds. And I just hope that, um, I just hope that um, people, will, people will persevere in studying them or in being guided by the big pictures and not just the technical, technical strands that will eventually peter out if, um, if, if, we don't, if we don't have large goals. So, um, yeah, so one of the, so when, when I first started trying to understand three manifolds, there's some idea that I had of, you know, I mean, not, it's, it's, it's too, it's too, it's dignifying it too much to say it's an idea, but, uh, you know, I, I had a desire to really own the three manifolds. So, so what are, what do they look like? What do three manifolds look like? So we have, partial answers to what they look like. Every, every three manifold can be decomposed into geometric pieces. This is a actually, you know, slight, when you go into all the details, it's slightly, it seems very technical, but the, the main answer is that most, almost all three manifolds look hyperbolic like this. And in some sense, you can answer many, many questions by using the hyperbolic structure. You can tell when two three manifolds are homeomorphic. You can, um, in principle, we can, we can make a list of all three manifolds where each one occurs once and only once. So in, in, some, in some sense, they're classified. 
but in some other sense, they're not classified. So it's, it, it's in, in some way, there's a picture of all possible three manifolds that's, even though most of them are hyperbolic, the, hyperbol the ones that are, have this hyperbolic geometry are, are still hard to, um, still hard to, um, whatever, organize in your mind and um, hard, to, hard to really own them. But I think it's pretty clear there are many glimpses of different kinds of structure, um, different kinds of interrelations of, of these three manifolds, both with, um, both with each other and with other parts of um, mathematics and science. So, so I think that is the, I mean, finding this, getting this big picture better organized, I think, is, is, the, is the main <coughs> goal I see for the future of three manifolds. So one, one of the big, one, one of these, uh, one of the, um, you know, one of the um, structures that I'd like to know a lot more about is, is this. So we can, as I said, you can start with any, any three manifold. You can get other three manifolds by um, cutting out knots and links, like, you know, like I just did. You, you cut out some circles, one or more circles, you remove them, and you glue them back together, you glue them back in. So this gives a, um, so, so you can think of, um, And all oriented three manifolds are connected in this way. All, well, if, if we wanted to do non-oriented three manifolds or three manifolds with boundary, it would be easy to modify this picture. But let's concentrate on closed oriented three manifolds. So this, this is a, um, so, the, so clo no, actually closed oriented three manifolds minus some set of link complements to make it nice. So the complement of a, of a link in a closed oriented, in closed oriented three manifolds of course, you know, complements of links in one manifold can be homeomorphic to complements of links in another manifold. Um, so the um, so um, so in this way, let's clear. Let me the the. That's not what I meant to do. This, this is the simplest um, hyperbolic link complement, the figure eight knot. One, once you have this one, this, this manifold, it has, a lot of, it has a lot of children, we can call it, by, which are obtained by gluing in, um, gluing in solid toruses. You know, it happens. It happens in hyperbolic geometry that whenever you, um, whenever you do a Dane filling, whenever you glue in a torus, the volume, um, the volume goes down. So here it says, oh, oh, you're not, you're not in the right, um, sorry. Sorry. There we are. Okay. There's the figure eight knot, the simplest manifold. I found the complement. It has volume 2.0. Um, I'll go back. Sorry, I didn't realize this was. It's volume 2.0298. Whenever you do a filling, um, it, the volume goes down. Um, this is one of the smaller, one of the smallest um, few hyperbolic three manifolds. So, 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 um, the, the set of all possible volumes of um, hyperbolic, well, of hyperbolic link complements in three manifolds, uh, hyperbolic three manifolds and hyperbolic link complements forms a, forms a um, well-ordered set where um, 
in other words, it's a, there's a countable set of possible vo values for the volume, and they can only converge in the upward direction. And the only, only kind of convergence of these volumes is by, um, by this process of, if, if you do a Dane filling with higher and higher coefficients, then it converges to the volume of the original thing. So if I put 100 for one of these coefficients, it's going to be see 2.029. 2 um, it, it converges to to the to the to the value of the volume for the um, link complement <coughs> itself. And and so the, the three we can think of the three manifolds as a directed set, th three manifolds that are link complements. You can think of them as a directed set or, or a partially ordered set. That is where um, where one is less than the other if it's obtained by Dane filling. And this gives a, this, this order gives an order topology on three manifolds. So there's, you know, there's some kind of, so it makes it into a, a kind of topological space. I mean, at the, at the point, I, I mean, saying it in this way, it's a disconnected topological space. But actually, there's a way to interpolate, <coughs> there's a way to interpolate and instead of thinking of a countable set of um, values you obtain by Dane filling on a three manifold, you can, there's, a, there's a way to interpret a continuous parameters for this. And then we get a, for each, for any not complement, then you, you obtain a two dimensional family of sort of singular spaces of which a discrete set are three manifolds. For, for, if you have a, a, a link complement with um, two components, then, then you get a, you get a two parameters for each link component. So you get a sort of four parameter family, a four dimensional family of possible fillings. And these, so, so this is the, I mean, this is one, I think one of the main key objects in three manifold topology of which we, I think we know enough to know it's sort of beautiful, but we don't know enough to know to know all about its shape, the sort of Dane filling space for a three manifold. So the, um, there, there's a, well, I won't, I won't. Um, there, there's a kind of inverse process now Um, of, of Dane drilling. So, so in, this in this particular program, um, you can find, you can find lengths of, once you find a hyperbolic three, structure for three manifold, you can find lengths of curves within the three manifold and you can, um, now we can drill it out and we get a, um, we get a new manifold. Now you can see the volume is 3.296. And I, um, now I, I unfilled the original one that was filled. So what I did, I took a figure eight knot, I filled it, then I unfilled another, another piece of the three, you know, another knot within the resulting three manifold, and I unfilled the original three manifold. We got, um, We got something of um, we get we get this picture. Anyway, we get it's actually the whitehead link that you, you get by by doing that. Anyway, it turns out that for many many low volume three manifolds, when you when you drill out the shortest curves, you arrive back at the same few. Um, few sort of master manifolds. So, so you know, there's zillions of, there's zillions of possible three manifolds. It, it becomes, you know, it's hard to get a grasp of all, of all of them. They're just, you know, large, large numbers of constructions. But they seem to, they seem to, when you put them together in the space of the Dane filling space, they seem to have a, they seem to have a fairly simple structure that where, um, 
at least at, least at first, where many of them are, are descended by Dane Fillings from the same master, same few master manifolds. So anyway, I think this is one of the, one of the things that needs to be done with um, three manifolds is understanding the big picture of all these three manifolds together. Okay, now there are, there are a lot of, there are a lot of other um, structures related to three, uh, the three manifold topology and geometry. And so far they, they kind of fit together, I would say, in creaky ways. They fit together, but I mean, we only know connections in weak ways. Anyway, an another structure, for instance, for another connection with hyperbolic three manifolds is that um, they all, um, they depend on algebraic number fields. So each one, any hyperbolic three manifold has, it, it's, it's rigid, and as a consequence of rigidity, all the, um, all the lengths of curves are, um, or the logs of lengths of curves are algebraic numbers. And in, if they're if they're represent if they're done with um, if they're if they're described exactly with um, elements of PSL two C, then there's a the, the field of traces is a well defined sort of topological invariant of a of a um, of a three manifold. And I think there are a lot of basic questions about the connection of the topology to the to the um, number theory and. You know, like, well, there's an elementary fact that if, if a field occurs as a field of traces for a, um, for a hyperbolic manifold, then it has to have at least, it can't be totally real. It has to be, have at least one complex embedding. But I don't actually know of any other known condition, but on the other hand, um, the constructions and the examples are, are, are a little, I mean, it's hard to, for, 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 you know, it's hard to target a particular field and get a three manifold that has that particular field as its field of coefficients. It's, it's, I think we know enough to know there's a lot of stuff lurking there, but we also know enough to know that we are far from knowing the complete answer. So that's one, one connected structure structure connected to three manifolds, it's, um, it's highly, I think, quite interesting. Another, another structure, sort of a little bit orthogonal from this commensurability structure, is the, I mean, the, from the stain filling structure, is the commensurability structure. So we now know that um, all three manifolds, I mean, we, we know that all three manifolds are virtually finite. They, any, any element of the fundamental group can be for any element of the fundamental group of a three manifold, there's some homomorphism to a finite group that, where that element doesn't go to the identity. Or to put it another way, another, any closed loop in the three manifold that's not, can't be um, compressed to the identity, for any such thing, there exists a finite seated cover where it lifts to an arc rather than lifts to a loop. So, so this means there's a rich family of finite sheeted covers of three manifolds. Um, and um, for, and I guess the theorem of my goal, Gula says that for a, well, the, the three manifolds are sorted into two classes, the, the so-called arithmetic three manifolds, where, where the set of, um, fi relations of finite sheeted covers has infinitely many local minima. And then there's the non-arithmetic ones where Margulis proof there's a unique local minimum in each commensurability class. This is another area where it's clear more is going to happen sometime in the future, hopefully sooner rather than later. But like how do we, how do we find the minimum in a commensurability class? Doesn't seem. It, it doesn't seem. It doesn't seem 
Well, it's clearly a doable problem, but I don't know, uh, I don't know of any current solution to that. But m more to the point, sort of what are the, what are the relations of the commensability structure to this Dane filling structure for three manifolds? Um, okay, so the other, other important structures, I think, in, 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 in three manifolds are, of course, the quantum invariants, which I personally don't know, I, I'm personally not at all an expert in, but, um, you know, everything has to fit together ultimately, so how does it fit into these sorts of structures, for instance? But, um, yeah, but other things I have been interested in are the theory of foliations, the theory of um, contact structures, the theory of laminations on three manifolds, and also conformal and quasi-conformal dynamics, which was very important in the earlier phase of um, proofs of the geometrization conjecture where, well, when I proved that um, <coughs> Hawking manifolds have a geometric decomposition. It used this technology very, uh, very closely connected to the theory of iterated, well, complex dynamics, iterated rational maps, but also connected to, you know, the whole uh, Kleinian groups and a whole, whole tradition. Um, so I believe, I believe there's a bigger picture, there's a big picture of this complex dynamics in um, lurking where ultimately there should be a simple answer that proves the geometrization conjecture along that sort of, um, along that sort of path. I think we might, see the, the, see the fact of the proof of the geometrization conjecture doesn't actually change a whole lot, except that people are no longer motivated and rewarded to work on the proof of the geometrization conjecture. Because this geometrization conjecture, I mean, at least the non Poincare part of the geometrization conjecture was, had pretty strong evidence that it was actually true, just not proven for a long time before um, Perlman um, finished, well, Perlman and others finished, finished it off. But, um, and, yeah, so the, the fact isn't what's going to lead into the future because that had largely been discounted in, in that people, people would write mathematical papers with, you know, assuming the geometrization conjecture is true, you know, so, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't change much. Now that it's known that's true, it just changes one sentence in a paper like that. I mean, I think the same, that's been known, actually, for the Poincaré conjecture, that's, um, Papa Kirikopoulos told me. Well, I, I, anyway, in a, in a sense, that had been discounted even, you know, for 40 or 50 years, because it was known that it's sort of independent of a lot of other three-dimensional topology. But hopefully, the work that was motivated by trying to prove the Poincaré conjecture both the Ricci flow stuff and the um, conformal dynamic stuff, hopefully that kind of technique can, can find ways to go on to, I mean, can go on to um, further, further plateaus and further steps because um, it's, you know, it's very interesting and good stuff in itself. And I hate to see it sort of wither away just because the main original goal is, is missing. And I do believe there's a, well, I, I don't think I can communicate it right now. It's, it's getting late, too. But um, I, I do think there should be a simple picture where you, where you set up, correctly set up some process. You start with an unknown three manifold. You set up some process and some, there should be some um, both implementable and theoretically justified method where, where it just, well, it just flows into finding the geometric decomposition. In principle, the Ricci flow is like that, but 
as far as I, as far as I know anyway, the implementation is, is quite hard. And also the, I mean, the conceptualization is also tricky. But, but I think simplification, simplification is extremely important. And, um, yeah, yeah, so I, I, I do think, like some of the other co complex dynamics things, there should be a simple, a simple way to conceptualize why three manifolds have this geometric decomposition. And, and how all these other structures fit together, the Dane filling, the commensurability, and the, um, well, foliations and laminations and contact structures and quantum invariants, all these things are floating around asking to be better, um, better tied together. I guess, I guess what I'm saying, partly, I, I mean, I do think currently periodical topology is still thriving, even though something like the Poincare conjecture could be, could sort of take all the wind, and the geometrization conjecture could sort of take the wind out of the sails and make everybody go elsewhere. I think there's a lot going on. But I think there's also a lot of further goals of finding the big picture. That's what I really want to say. Oh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very interesting thing. I mean, well, I mean, of course, there are always problems that are, problems that one can name that are NP-complete or something like that, because even in two-dimensional <laughs> geometry, there are problems like that. But a lot of things in three-dimensional topology seem to be, um, if you ask the right question, it seems to be, it seems to have been hard to find answers, but it seems like a lot of things are answerable. Even, it's one of the interesting things. That the, the level of complexity is somehow just right. That, you know, in four manifolds, we know a lot of things are unsolvable. So SNAP-P, for instance, um, works sort of instantaneously on any reasonable example. It works, you know, works most of the time and almost instantaneously. I don't think there's any... Um, I don't think there's any theoretical basis for that. And, um, yeah. I don't want to name a computational complexity question, but I do think there's a lot, I think there's a lot to be learned about, um, because there's, I think there are a lot, a lot of simpler processes than we've yet discovered. That's what's actually interesting about it. Um, Rob, you can answer that. <laughs> uh, I, I think uh, it's, I, I think it's the weak manifold. It's the weak manifold. It, it's known as... As well as a zero, in, in, in two weeks, I suppose we'll say so. Uh-huh. Yeah, we, we basically and what is that number? It's uh, like zero point nine four two seven. Is that... Is, <laughs> and that's, that's just an approximation, right? Yeah, approximation. What's the exact number? <laughs> So, so the first few no, the, the first few are, I mean, they're known, but there's questions of rigor. Uh, anyway, they've been kind of known for a while, really, but because people have looked and looked and looked and only found the smallest few. But, um, but you know, that that kind of that kind of work is what's important for getting the structure of this lattice of Dane fillings. I mean, that's what's most interesting, I think, is to, you know, not necessarily the rigorous identification of the first, you know, of ordinals with volumes for the first few ones, but, but getting techniques that can actually understand the structure.
Let's speak to people. 